Again, uh, welcome, and I think it's an exciting time uh, to talk about advances in endoscopy and in surgery. To start the session, uh, I think something that's very critical for us as uh, endoscopists is looking at the endoscopic imaging for colorectal dysplasia. And for that, we have Jonathan Cohen, is a gastroenterologist professor of medicine at uh, NYU Langone, and is going to talk to us about his thoughts regarding endoscopic imaging, and I look forward to his presentation. And a reminder again, please turn off your cell phones. If I catch you once, fine. If I catch you twice, you're out. Thank you so much. And we can have the lights down a little bit if we can, please. So thank you so much for this great invitation. And uh, so we're going to be uh, t scoping slowly, talking quickly with a lot of great images. And that's what we're really about, uh, looking and understanding how to look, what we're looking for. So uh, we're going to see how we're going to put imaging to use in your practice. So the take homes, we want to know better what to look for and uh, how to inspect the mucosa better to detect more adenomas if we can. Um, how we can uh, recognize advanced histology when we see it, it alters our approach. And then really focusing on improving your margin detection. So why is it important? Well, finding more polyps does matter. And there's data about this. And also complete resection matters. And you know that, uh, as you see, when they can't resect it completely. Um, and also, there's a wider than you expect w range of performance. And by measuring your performance, as with anything, uh, can make you better. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about some technique and also technology to improve your performance. So there's lots of data that shows that uh, if you get to the cecum, uh, uh, you have a high completion rate, you have a higher, a lower uh, interval cancer rate. This is a Baxter study from Canada. Uh, it's a very important study. Um, and um, the key principle uh, colonoscopy quality measure would be adenoma detection rate. It's not the only thing that matters. You want to detect all polyps. But uh, it does correlate with colorectal cancer incidence in three years. So this is a very good, clean uh, indicator. So what happens if we miss the target and we don't get the, uh, uh, find uh, uh, the target of 25% in our screening population? Well, uh, this paper here from Corley that came out last year in the New England Journal is a really essential one to look at. It's a humbling paper because it shows that for every 1% increase in ADR, you can decrease interval colon cancer by 3%. And just think of it, if you do 213 screening exams, you, you get yourself from a 19 to 53, you can actually save one life. Okay, that's something you can put your hand around. If that doesn't impress you, you can look at, this is death from colon cancer, showing it gets better even when you go above the threshold. So it just doesn't, you're not done once you hit the, the threshold. You can keep getting better and keep imp impacting your patients. This slide was from a pilot we did at, uh, at multi-center in, in 2005, um, showing benchmarking. But you may say, well, our unit, our hospital, is we're, we're meeting the benchmark. So, but what happens in everywhere you look, some folks are above and some folks are below uh, the threshold. So there's a wide range. Um, this is a, um, at the um, uh, a, a, uh, New York City, had a, a 16 centers, uh, looked over three years at their uh, rates of, um, of um, adenoma detection and using um, uh, GI Quick. And again, we saw this wide range um, in all these groups, and many of the groups met the criteria for adenoma detection rate. So they took the data and went back to the units. They also had data on PrEP and um, and uh, withdrawal time and various other factors. And then they went and they tried to uh, impact um, uh, performance. And if you see, this is just one group. And 24% were above threshold and 20% were below threshold for finding adenomas. And by the end of just one year, that was 42% were now above the, the minimum threshold and only 13 were low. So it shows that having the data and going back and looking at it, you can actually make yourself better. So it's pretty compelling. The other thing is reporting. You know, this is just one paper in, uh, that a bunch of gastroenterologists started reporting their ADRs publicly. And just by doing that in the unit, they got everyone got their adenoma detect detection rate up. That's not a surprise. Uh, but uh, so data is important, and um, the patients are increasingly asking about this. Now let's turn our, our turn to how do we actually improve our performance to detect dysplasia. And it really is not just the modalities, but how you actually use them. So these are the 
sort of five ways of looking that I like to focus on. First is looking cleaner. Getting your ADR up to par if you're doing community practice uh, colonoscopy, prep is your low-hanging fruit. You've got to be doing a split dose. You've got to make sure that second dose is actually four or five hours before and not eight hours before. Um, it saves uh, about a quarter of preps, even in studies, are not uh, really adequate. Adequate to bring someone back in the appropriate interval um, uh, and um, at least increase costs, re more repeat procedures, likely more interval cancers, certainly more uh, 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 less, uh, less uh, detection of polyps. Looking closer, and we don't do much image recognition training. We just focus on learning how to get to the cecum, and then uh, and then we, you know, and, and and but looking and how do we look? So one way the Japanese do it very well is they do a lot of freeze framing, and uh, they stop. They if they see something a little funny, they look at it, they think about it, and then they move on. We should start thinking about that. We need to teach about how to look for subtle alterations, and I think you do this in the operating room a lot. But we do this a lot during colonoscopy. Any little blemish, we give it a closer look. Now, we need to learn to look more closely at, at things, at, a, at a, more, a more focused in, in order to be able to find the wolf that's hiding behind the, uh, the tree. And they are there, hiding behind the tree or the fold. Um, knowing what to look for. Know to look for little debris so that's, uh, you know, that, that might be not, not washing off, might be the sign of a flat, uh, serrated polyp. This is the egg drop soup sign. Uh, I'm sorry if, uh, if it uh, ruins your taste for soup. Um, Looking slower, okay, so um, the f this is the landmark study that showed that uh, withdrawal time mattered and increased not only your detection of small polyps, but also large ones. But other studies, including one here in Boston at Beth Israel, didn't show that. It showed it maybe the inspection quality that matters. Um, but uh, you've got to go slow enough to be able to see uh, what, you're, um, what you're looking for. Okay, so the new technology, high definition. Well, we had chromoendoscopy for a long time, and now we have optical contrast techniques and, and high resolution scopes. So chromo is really good for seeing the slight elevations of these uh, uh, and the topography changes. You can also look up close and look at uh, uh, pit patterns and, and such. It's very useful in, 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 in looking at large laterally spreading tumors and deciding about whether they have features of cancer and deciding whether to try and take them out with poly polypectomy or whether uh, or not to. Okay. okay. So narrow band imaging focuses in uh, on the light that incident to the uh, mucosa and then it goes to light that only is is um, it penetrates uh, uh, narrowly and um, and uh, highlights the where the vessels are where the hemoglobin absorbs the uh, the light and uh, therefore you can see fine patterns again you can see this little lattice a uh, honeycomb lattice of the vessels that line the um, the normal pits so to detect dysplasia we need to recognize three things color differences the patterns of the vessels and then the patterns of the mucosa. So look, there's no difference in the color here in this hyperplastic polyp. This is uh, eye scan images. Again, no differences in these hyperplastic polyps. Here there's a stark color difference. But you're also now looking at these ve vessels. And with these vessels, you can very clearly see that, th uh, see that this is an adenoma. Um, th the vessels, as they get thicker, uh, become more adenomatous towards cancer, and they get more in disarray and irregular. It's fairly simple. Um, these parallel the pit patterns that they we pioneered by Kudo in Japan. Um, this is a blend or um, pattern, a little round uh, stellate uh, hyperplastic polyp. Here the vessels are brown and crunchy and they're, they're, they're packed together with a fine demarcation. These are tubular adenomas. I think you're going to need a lot to see a lot of repetition of these to really get uh, good with it. You can see it with any modality, with eye scan polyps. You can see it with FICE as well. Okay. And now this, this polyp, you see a topography change and very irregular vessels. And this is a cancer uh, in a polyp. Okay, it's a type 3 advanced vessels. Now you're seeing actually, because of the imaging, you can actually see the pit patterns as well. So you can look at the mucosal pattern, and this is with chromoendoscopy, the typical tubular adenoma pattern. So there's some st these are some image recognition. You learn there are two different types of hyperplastics, the bland polyp, uh, uh, where you don't see much of anything, and maybe some fine capillaries, or these black dots with white surrounding. Now look at that, black dots, white surrounding. And now let's compare it to this, white dots with black surrounding. 
So it's really very simple, and these are adenomas. So white dots with black surrounding is an adenoma. Now you also can see a convoluted sort of tubular uh, structures, uh, which is um, gyrus pattern, and that's another pattern for adenoma. Now this would be an adenoma in a zebra, okay, because you see you have the, uh, the white dots with a black pattern. So, um, but the question really is for you uh, today, do you see more uh, polyps with blue light than you do with white light? And really the answer from the literature is no. As long as you're using the high resolution, you can get your adenoma detection rate really up to 50% in some, a lot of studies and a lot of folks who get used to it. Um, what about this one, serrated polyps? This is going to be the big future one. Can we detect more of these? These are where a lot of our missed cancers on the right side are. And we've got to start learning to look at them. There's one paper by Tapadelli uh, that uh, looks at a lot of the characterizations. You can see these little rims of debris. You can see nodularity. Um, uh, you can see um, uh, a number of, of, of features, mucus caps. Now, I must say that um, don't forget to inspect the anal mucosa. Now, surgeons are usually pretty good at this, uh, and but I think gastroenterologists really have to know to pay attention. Just this past week, I've had uh, uh, one case of uh, uh, a high-grade dysplasia I detected. By looking at the squamous mucosa, um, you can see these little fine dots. Those are the, the capillary loops that come perpendicular. Okay. Now, this is just two cases of screening colonoscopy in women. On the top panel, you see someone, and I just turned around, I see a hyperplastic anal papilla. And here's another one, but look at this, these little funny dark vessels over here and uh, that um, are irregular and thick, and that was a AIN3 lesion, asymptomatic, and uh, so it was a good, good finding by looking, knowing what to look for and looking. So the last really topic is looking more completely. So, uh, th and this is nice because you use both low-tech and high-tech to do a better job here. Um, you've got to go and um, if you don't see a fold, you know, it's good to have your nurse or assistant give you an elbow now and then if you don't see everything to go on back. It's a reality check. Um, and it's humbling. If you go back and find a polyp, you didn't think you saw an area, then you go back and find it, especially if that's the only one in the case. That really uh, uh, it has imp Im impact. Retroflex in the cecum, if you can, I can't always do it, but I do try. Um, um, and, um, and then p changing the patient position if you're not seeing something well at a flexure. This is an interesting paper out of Mayo, which was looking at computer-assisted diagnosis, which we're not there yet. We don't have a scope that will beep every time we get one of these red outs, you know, to keep us honest. So we have to do it ourselves. But I ask you, when you're scoping, do you see something on the top frame, how much? And when you see that, do you go back and look at it again? Now, this is a patient, 54-year-old guy, uh, screening exam. Nothing is, first of all, look, that's a good prep. Okay, that is a good prep, and that's what you need to see, use imaging. You need to see something like this. So uh, you turn around, I turned around, and I saw this uh, lesion right here. The only lesion he had, it was 10-millimeter adenoma. He would have probably had a cancer, probably, in, uh, because I would not have come back for 10 years. So there are a lot of newer solutions. The interesting thing about all the technology here is that they all find more polyps. They all find about 15, tw maybe 20 percent more polyps, some in behind the fold. So there are more polyps there. Um, um, and uh, the three millimeter cap is pretty easy. The other thing, some of the things are more expensive to use. You can flatten the fold in various, with various contraptions. And there are also some newer te uh, technologies uh, to look uh, sideways and, uh, and retroflexing while you're pulling back. Um, these are two that I've used in my practice easily. The real question, these are endo rings and endo cups. You just put them on the scope, and they're extremely easy to use um, to sort of guide your folds back as you're pulling back. But the real question I have, and we don't know the answer yet, is are they just for the low detectors to get them up to, up to par, or are they for only patients at high risk, or are they for everybody? Um, okay, so how are we going to, uh, in, in your practice, advance histology? If you can learn to notice the patterns I showed you earlier, um, you can see. Sometimes you see one of these things, you know that you better inject underneath it, okay, to get a good margin. Or you may decide not to go and biopsy it, uh, but to actually um, either, either do an e uh, EMR or um, advanced technique, or uh, maybe if, it's a, if you think it may be a cancer, maybe that's one that needs to be resected if it can't be removed endoscopically. But notice this polyp. There is a, a depression in the middle and the vessels are very irregular. 
So this is, a, this is a cancer to prove and otherwise. Now you can inject underneath it and if it gets a good injection, I would certainly try and take this out. But I, you need to think about it ahead of time. This is a polyp that was a high grade histology. You can see in this area here where the uh, mucosal pattern changes abruptly from everywhere else. So this is just a, an area of, uh, of high grade dysplasia within a polyp. But this polyp I might take off with a snare, but because I see this, I'm gonna inject underneath it. And this changes your management so you do a better job. Lastly, improving complete resection. About a third of interval cancers are probably related to not taking the polyp off completely. Uh, this is a, um, uh, just a short video, uh, just uh, making the point that when you're taking off a nice big polyp, you really got to do a retroflex and a look around the fold. Uh, this is one reason why uh, some of these things on the right side are not uh, completely, um, completely taken off. I'm going to, um, um, so can we use our imaging to, uh, to help us with the margins? The answer is probably yes. Uh, here is a video here. This is a patient who had polypectomy and came back because the doctor said, I don't think I got it all, but um, I don't think that they realize just how much. Now, you, you often can see things on white light when you have already looked at them on narrow band, but um, looking at this uh, image um, up close, you see the, the dark areas are extend way above it. It's very flat, and then you're going to come up close to it, and you're going to go on near focus, which is a magnification feature, and you can see a very fine demarcation. Those are all those Sano2, um, you know, adenomenous, uh, you know, um, areas not high grade dysphology, but it's it's an extensive area, easily removed endoscopically uh, if uh, if detected. Every time I do a polypectomy now, I do a uh, I do a, a, a narrow band magnification look at the at the margins to see that I got normal pit patterns that I got a complete resection. So to conclude, if you want to find more polyps and leave less behind, make sure you have a clean clear field of vision. Use high resolution scopes. Look behind the folds, retroflex when you can, and re-examine if you didn't see anything just right. You gotta go slowly enough to take advantage of any of these imaging techniques. You need to know what you're looking for, the mucosal patterns, the vessels, um, and whenever anything abruptly changes, that's a, a red flag. I think I would use the optical contrast and get used to using it to look for when there's worrisome pathology that would alter your management and an accurate margin assessment to make sure you get it out completely the first time. And whatever you do, measure how well you're doing and you'll do better. Thank you very much.